being here today. And uh, from Tomomi, we know from last time that she's a strategic interaction designer and a coach. And uh, Oriana is a social change consultant, also a coach. That's how they met, actually, in a coaching program a few years ago. And I would just, um, yeah, with this, give it over to you. And um, you can let us know yeah, what were the motivations of doing this work, maybe related to your background that you want to dive deep. Like, what does it mean to work in emotions and being an interaction designer or working on the nonprofit space? And then, yeah, we'll use this chance that we can have, um, let's say, the emotions at work framing to dive deeper into emotions and organizing and yeah, what it does to us. What can we do? So all of that I have. Um, I listened to the conversation I had with Tomomi a few months ago. And yeah, there are a few things that I'm like, okay, you didn't learn it the first time. So second chance <laughs> to go deeper uh, into that, see if it sticks. So yeah, over to you, Tomomi and Oriana, what brought you to launch Emotions at Work? Why is it relevant for the type of work that you do and the impact you want to have? Yeah. Hi, Alicia, and thanks so much for having me and Ariana here and bringing up this topic of emotions into this conversation. We our original impetus and also our ongoing curiosity is to have more conversations about this topic. And so it's really special to us that um, like from your research perspective um, and the work that we do together as colleagues at Greater Than, that you're kind of coming back and continuing the conversation. I think it's like exactly like we want to do the program, of course, but uh, like that broader landscape is exactly what we want to explore. So this feels like it's like yes. <laughs> so thanks for that opportunity. Um, yeah, and the way you introduce me is basically what I do. I identify as a as a designer, um, working mostly in digital but very interested in the interactions between people, not just with the website, but between people and then how teams work together on whatever it is they want to get done. And over the years, I've become more and more interested in this. How can teams be more creative, be happier and more satisfied working together and tapping into the more innate curiosity and creativity and imagination that each of us have that maybe we're not really great at expressing in the workplace context. Um, and then I came through coaching kind of through a facilitation of which I do a lot as a consultant um, and realizing over the years that the stakes of the conversations I was needing to facilitate as they become more, you know, quote unquote strategic, like just the stakes were higher and the emotional aspect of that, of people's fear of change, um, which maybe you don't wanna say in front of your colleagues or like the anger and the frustration that you're carrying into the context of the workshop or this very big inertia that people carry into work as well. It's cause like, oh, just wait it out. It'll go away anyway. Um, and so, I realized that I really needed to work on me being able to hold all of these emotions coming up. Um, and to do that, like you need to work on yourself. You can't just become a better facilitator by working on these, these, these kind of techniques. Um, and so that's kind of been my journey into coaching and then realizing that and this is like Oriana and I met through the, the training that we took together at Newfield Network. And on the first couple of days, we're, we keep getting asked, like, why are you here? Because that answer changes as you start to learn more about what's going on and what's possible. And the answer I arrived to after a couple of days and being like, but I already know why I'm here, um, was really being able to listen more closely to the signals that were coming from inside for, from, me, from me and that I was overdeveloped in being able to tune into the signals externally. Uh, it's what makes me good at my job. 
it's what uh, helps me survive, you know, as a um, like Japanese female, for instance, like oldest child, like all these factors made it so that that part was overdeveloped and it's harder actually for me to understand what even my own emotions or my own perspectives were. Um, and so this is something I hold very dearly and also start to see super valuable for other people in my life and the people I meet through coaching as, as well. And so when we were looking for kind of angles, like, like we were both interested in, um, and I'd love Oriana for you to tell your story as well, because we kind of met in the middle um, or from different sides of our personal experiences. And it's like, yeah, this is a thing to keep exploring because uh, it's going to make such a difference for like our lives, like our coaching practices and for the people that we're, we're able to serve as coaches. Let me stop there and pass it to you, Ariana. Thank you, Tomomi, and thank you, Alicia, for having us. I'm really excited and grateful to be part of this conversation and to be able to really broaden and deepen the conversation that we're having around why we want to talk about emotions in the workplace, why Tomomi and I think it's important and have dedicated, you know, a big chunk of time, both personally and professionally, to kind of creating and being on this journey together. So my background comes from the nonprofit um, space, working in the social change sector. I worked for almost a decade in peace building and conflict mediation. And I was very passionate about my work, um, very driven. And there were so many positives to that. And at the same time, there were a lot of emotions involved. And I ultimately experienced a great deal of overwork and burnout, which led me to make a career change, a career transition. And I didn't have, I think, the clarity and awareness that I have now of how much emotions played a role in getting to that point. And that is what led me really to pursue coaching. So now I work as a leadership and a professional development coach, and as well as you mentioned, a social change consultant with nonprofits and socially conscious businesses. And this really comes from a place of wanting to see how coaching um, and facilitation can support staff well-being and actually the environment in the nonprofit sector and the nonprofit space where there's such a sense of often kind of urgency and scarcity and um, I think the other emotion that I felt most prominently was um, also a sense of kind of dread for what might happen if this work isn't done in an effective way. That feels like a strong word, but I think it's important to recognize that there, there is this really strong emotional undertone in the nonprofit space. And so I didn't see that talked about. I, I didn't see that there were conversations happening around that in a way that I felt was supportive as, um, as an employee in that space. And so what drew me to becoming a coach was really to say, well, what would be possible if we actually brought emotions into the conversation? If we actually talked about what is causing overwork and burnout and high employee turnover rates in the sector? And what would it look like if we actually paid attention to that in a different way and that could help create the positive change that these individuals, collectives, organizations are seeking in the world. And so this brings me to uh, the Newfield Zoom room that Tomomi and I met in in 2021, where we did our coach training. And ultimately, what brought us to our collaboration and our partnership with Emotions at Work. And this was, again, for me, this personal spark of recognizing how little I was actually connected to my own emotional space. I had always thought of myself as in a very emotional, sensitive person, uh, but I soon 
recognize and realize that I didn't have kind of the awareness or the vocabulary to be able to often really name and identify how I was feeling and then to know what to do with that, how to navigate it or move through it. And so a lot of it was um, pushed down in a way that wasn't very effective. And when we started to work with the emotional space in our coach training, and this became more available to me to say, oh, I'm feeling actually timid and shy or embarrassed and judged or um, confused and doubtful. When I was able to name more specifically how I was feeling, I suddenly felt like I had data that I could actually work with, something that I could move through. And so Again, this brought me to wondering, just out of curiosity, right, Tomomi, of, well, if this is so powerful for me as an individual, what would happen if this conversation was on a bigger scale and within the workplace? What if we actually talk about how we feel instead of just saying, oh, I'm stressed at work, I'm overwhelmed, and just leaving it at that of kind of these metaphors of describing how a lot of us are feeling? Um, in the professional space? Um, and what if we stop judging how we're feeling and actually look at it as information that we can work with and say, well, why am I feeling really frustrated at this colleague? Or why am I feeling really doubtful about this presentation or this project? So I'm sure we'll get into that more um, as our conversation unfolds. But the final thing that I'll, I'll say is that you know, this is, this is a journey for Tomomi and I, and I think that has been a really wonderful part for me is we are learning each and every day in our partnership and our collaboration and with everyone that joins our program. We just finished our third cohort and we have so many new learnings that we're unpacking and we'll be excited to share some of those today. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Yes, I definitely want to hear about the learnings uh, because I think since the mommy and I met, you've done at least one more cohort. So I guess um, there's a lot there. But I wanted to ask you because you've pointed to what would it be possible if, you know, we worked with emotions and so that we could deal with turnover and burnout. And can you give us some example there of, let's say, let's think about, well, burnout is a lot. Um, or has been a lot talked about in the past few uh, years also as a um, phenomenon that is becoming more, more and more unfortunately also in the nonprofit sector. So what, what are things that we can do from an emotional perspective to deal with that? Uh, because I guess we can do lots of different things from a structural perspective. Um, but yeah, do you have any, I don't know, like hints or like what are the elements that you worry the most with in, in that area? Yeah, great question. And I'll be happy to jump in. One example that is really powerful, I think, from my own experience and that has been coming up over and over in conversation is something that I learned from Dan Newby, who is someone I trained with in emotion-centered coaching. And this is the idea that there are some terms that we use, such as overwhelmed, that are not actually emotions, but really metaphors to describe how we're feeling. And this is one we often hear in the workplace is staff are overwhelmed or I'm feeling really overwhelmed with work. But there's not much we can do with that. It just kind of feels like we're swimming in the overwhelm. And so what Dan shared with me and what I often share with others is, okay, well, what if we actually look at what are the emotions at the root of that overwhelm. And it's gonna be different for different people and at different times. Um, often for me, when I'm feeling overwhelmed, there's the emotion of urgency is present or perhaps confusion or doubt. And once I'm able to look at that, as an individual, I can say, okay, well, what is actually urgent or not urgent? How can I work with that and what I have on my plate in order to navigate that emotion or minimize it or decrease it? And I think the same can be done with teams, right? If you're a leader or a manager, to be able to understand why is my staff feeling overwhelmed with this project or with a situation, to be able to actually have a conversation and identify how are they feeling and why, 
then it gives you information that you can work with to shift the working environment, to shift the team environment, to be able to have conversations that will help minimize that overwhelm or help you support your staff to navigate that emotional space. So that's one kind of more tangible example I can give. And I think there's also something to be said around not assuming how other people are feeling in the workplace, having open conversations, helping model that by naming what you're feeling and also having a team or staff that can feel comfortable and safe to name how they're feeling um, opens up a much bigger space for clear, honest communication and to kind of foster trust in the workplace, um, as opposed to kind of assuming how people feel based on their behaviors or their body language, for example. That's been a big one for me. I've shared with Tomomi in the past. I remember when I was in the beginning of my career and I had a boss tell me that the way that my body language was in certain meetings was inappropriate, that he could tell I was really frustrated. And it was because I would sit back with my arms crossed <laughs> with a certain look on my face and I was completely unaware that this is how I was coming off. Um, and I think luckily I had a boss that was able to kind of open that conversation in a kind way and lead me through thinking about that. But this is something that happens all the time where we're often not even aware how, what are the signals that we're giving with our body language um, and how are we reading other people and how does that impact the dynamic in the workplace? Tomomi, do you have any thoughts to add? Yeah, yeah, all these stories, right? Think about in the professional realm, we have these patterns of how we diagnose how things are what's happening and a lot of it is around like oh we don't have enough time or oh i'm not able to convince somebody and we work on these as the actual challenges uh, it, it's often related to kind of logistical things like um, like an access to somebody or just having too many tasks um, and so the solutions stay at that level and a lot of times it doesn't work because that's not the actual issue or like that's just the expression of the issue um, and I think we find in our own experiences and in coaching but also in, in other spaces by taking an emotional lens it kind of cracks open so much more material to work with maybe you you feel that the problem is about organizational silos in our work, in your organization. Um, but maybe emotionally you're kind of suffering from a sense of isolation, not, not being seen, not feeling like you belong. And it's actually that that can be tapped into and worked on. Then it's not about having access to it, whatever SharePoint or like adding another meeting um, so I find all of that quite fascinating as these challenges are quite common, like shared across companies and industries, actually. Um, and the solutions are like never anything really novel or actually really interesting. It's like, yeah, I mean, we're talking about time, so then the solution will be about time. Um, and so there's like this paradigm shift that's actually possible when we use a different lens to gather data as, as Ariana was saying. And like kind of from a design perspective, like I find this really exciting. Like there's just a different room full of material to, to play with and shape. And like this is very, it kind of makes me lean in and be like, so now what can we do? And, you know, we stop talking about silos or, oh, we're working remotely. And so like, that's the problem. It's like, mm, is it really? So that's kind of my crusade. <laughs> and one of the, the learnings, I think, and, and, and how we can equip people and like experiment so that 
this can happen in kind of light practices. It's not like, you know, a huge change that you need to do. I think that's like where our current fascination is. What are the daily things that can be put into practice? Yeah, I find that fascinating as well. And I keep saying that it cannot be that simple. There has to be something difficult and complex and complicated about it. Because actually, most of the time, I know it's also my experience about being curious, being open, opening conversations, and then open up this, like Brene Brown calls them, these stories, right? Like, what's the story you're telling yourself? What's the story I'm telling myself? And then you put it on the table and then it's like, wow, okay. It's always, yeah, fascinating how far or like how busy we are all with yours with ourselves <laughs> I mean, it's funny and sad at the same time I find. Oh, yeah. yeah and um yeah there was something i wanted to ask you as well let's see yes so like, i wanted to go somewhere else but i have two coaches in the room so i have to ask it uh oh. the opportunity uh, no, because also that's one of the things that came out of my uh, realization I had after our conversation a few months ago, uh, Tomi, um, that was this thing of that um, I think because of the research and the area of research I'm in, which it's like we don't even or barely talk about it, maybe more at the beginning, is like this social construct um, thing that we, you know, we are not determined, but we are influenced or highly influenced by our environment. And, and of course, then we talk about self-organizing where we have all of these power dynamics that we try to make explicit. So we're always analyzing the system in a way. And I think that although I'm a big believer in, let's say, personal agency, that said, when you reach, I don't know, like, a, or when you are at a level of privilege, but anyway, it's different for each person. Uh, that I remember that I yeah just got this reminder, like, yeah, you can actually still do a lot. Um, or some things. And um, also then when we talk about that with you, we have, or we're having this conversation now that is more about, let's say, in a way, traditional organizations that we could be talking about any type of organization right now. It's not only specifically about self-organizing. And then linking this to the topic of burnout, this is something that um, I find super interesting because for me, it's like I didn't get a, a burnout, but I, I had a feeling I was scratching uh, getting very close to it um, a couple of years ago. And then I started seeing all of these blog posts on Medium about how people deal with their burnout. And, you know, they just meditate a little bit and get all, <laughs> this, uh, you know, mindfulness and change your attitude around work. I'm like, what's this bullshit? Like, you know, it's like, for me, it required that I had to half my work, um, half my income, like lots of, let's say, more systemic uh, things mm -hmm. around me but then listening to you I'm like okay like what's actually the power that you can have if you say okay there are many things I cannot change but how far can you go with this um, emotional lens so I don't know if there's anything there that um, you could say like what actually the power of that is of um, changing a little bit how you see things how you interact with others like what is that is what is this room full of um afterwards or or i don't know if i'm answering my own question as i'm speaking like i don't know just wanted to throw this one at you it's <laughs> <laughs> a great question and probably something we could talk about for hours at length <laughs> what comes to mind that i would share from my experience is Burnout is different for different people and we, we all experience it differently. There, there's a physical and emotional and a mental component often. And I think the percentages of that may be different for different people depending on um, essentially why they're burning out, right? And I think without being attuned to your own inner landscape and understanding what emotions you're experiencing and why and you said right what are the stories i'm telling myself what are the stories that are connected to those emotions we have to begin to pull apart or, or maybe i shouldn't say we have to but if we start to pull those apart we're able to 
understand why we're starting to either scratch at that space or arrive at that space of burnout and then identify maybe what is it that we actually need to start to pull backwards. And perhaps for some people, it is meditation. Perhaps for others, as you said, it's completely cutting down on your workload and taking pressure off of yourself. I know that was my experience as well. I went from a nine to five to doing a year of research by myself and was completely in charge of my schedule and ended up resting a lot more than I expected. And that was important for me, given what I had been experiencing. What's powerful is naming those stories, right? If there's a story of this should be easier or this should be faster, we can start to be curious, oh, maybe frustration is part of the emotional cocktail that I'm experiencing right now. And start to ask and be curious about, is that true? Is it not? What can I do with that story? Is that story serving me or not? And I think this is really the powerful question is not our positive, our emotions positive or negative, but are they serving you or not? Often there's a reason that they're showing up there. They have a purpose. They're trying to alert us to something. And we can then be curious as the observer, let's say, of our emotional state and say, okay, is this serving me right now? If so, great. How? And if not, what do I need to do to shift or what emotion would actually serve me more? And I know I'm switching a little bit here now, but before we jumped on to recording, we were talking about this idea that you can be intentional about how you want to feel and not feel in a space. And I was sharing with you that this is something Tomomi and I often talk about when we're thinking about how we want to be collaborating together, how we want to run the program Emotions at Work. And... I've also recently been trained in something called the emotional culture deck, which is a card game that you can play with leaders and teams, staff to think about how they want to feel and not feel. And I used this physical card deck and I'll show since we're on recording to think about today how I wanted to feel and not feel. And so I went through the cards and I actually thought intentionally and said, I really want to feel lighthearted and thoughtful and at ease. And I, I might, but I don't want to feel hesitant or uncomfortable and uncertain. And while I'm human and I can't control my emotions, even just having that awareness of how I want to feel and not want to feel, I can then think about what do I need to do to prepare my space? How do I want to hold myself in my body? What story do I need to tell myself about the space that I'm in here with Alicia and Tomomi and the support that they're giving me and the nature of this conversation so that I can be at ease and show up in that way. Can you share the cards? Yes, I I can definitely share the cards. So I had lighthearted, thoughtful, and at ease. Mm -hmm. And then for how I don't want to feel, and I love this from the emotional culture deck, they always say, but I might from time to time. (laughs) is hesitant, Mm -hmm. uncomfortable, and uncertain. And I think the power in that is, I love being in conversation, but sometimes getting on here, talking, recording things, right? I might have just said to myself, oh, I'm feeling a little nervous this morning. And I wouldn't have really known what to do with that. But to be able to say, okay, I don't want to feel uncertain, uncomfortable, or hesitant, Then I could ask myself, okay, what do I need to do before we jumped on recording, right? What questions do I need to ask? How do I need to prepare myself to really feel comfortable and open and thoughtful? So, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. I think it gives like a very specific example. And actually, yeah, that's also just to bring the two topics together. That's a realization I had when I was preparing for this conversation and re-listening to what Tommy and I had talked about. And she gave me 
these gifts uh, that the two of you uh, work with. So how do I want to feel? What emotions do I want to feel in a conversation, in a project, in a collaboration? And I was amazed like how important that had been for me as an input from our previous conversation and how I massively forgot it um, during. So I, I think it was for me for a few weeks or months, I wanted to think. And then this year I completely forgot and gone to a collaboration that made me feel in ways I didn't want to. And I was not able to say, you know, stop this, what you're feeling when you're going to this, let's say kind of like not burnout, that's too big a word, but in a, too much of a tension in a collaboration that you don't want to feel like that. And when I heard it, I was like, I almost wanted to cry because it's like, you know, but it's like you had the tool, like, it's like so easy um, yeah, to, to forget this thing. So yeah, very ha- thankful that this is brought up into the space again. Yeah, it's, a moment. yeah th- it's about putting it into practice, right? And uh, Oriana, I also forget, and it's good we remind e- each other. And also to your point, Alicia, on kind of individual agency versus more systemic elements, I think our program and our approach is, it looks like it's focusing a lot on the self, um, but such an important component of that is that we can't do all of that for ourselves, but we can do it for each other when we are in community. And it doesn't have to be your best friend or your partner or the person you work with. If there is another human being who is able to help you regulate, ask some of these questions, this can happen. This can start to happen. We, we build these muscles. And uh, that's something we really believe in, in our program when strangers meet and they can do that for each other. And most people have never had that kind of experience, have never been in that kind of space to have these kinds of conversations. And then to be able to realize, oh, I'm different when I'm like this. And like, that's a data point you can then take back to say, but what if I do want to take this to my family, to my team, to my boss, but without you actually experiencing it yourself it's almost kind of impossible to imagine and so it's like yes self and like who are the other people around you and what's the relationship that you're able to build with them so that there's more of that quality in the conversations and interactions that you have with with the people around you and so that's kind of the groundswell that I believe our work is contributing to in the world. Um, And there's a a lot of that happening. I think kind of the very strong interests in these topics, and they can look like very many different things, right? Like whether it's embodiment or it's like some kind of yoga practice or some kind of, I don't know, witchcraft practice. Like they can look like very many different things with different flavors and aesthetics, Um, but that's what's in common. And this just happens to be our angle. And in a way, Oriana showing us her cards also is like helpful for me because I didn't take the time to do that. And by seeing Oriana's cards and I'm like, yeah, I also want to feel like this. And so that's kind of how it starts to have a ripple effect. Like you can help yourself, but you're also helping others. And if more people are able to do that, like the collective environment can become more easeful. Yeah, this is an important dimension of the whole thing, I think, because that's also, I think that's my, one of my life learnings among many others, but it's like, you don't have to, or sometimes you cannot do everything yes. on your own, yeah. right? It's like, and this emotional thing, like in the last uh, episode, I was talking to JD and uh, Emmanuel about embodiment, and actually the principle was, yes, it's about the body, but when you center the body, it's about the relationship with other bodies, right? That it's not only me, but it's this sort of togetherness. And that's the whole point of self-organizing, of community, of for me, community has always been the place where it's like, I like myself more mm-hmm. because of the practice of this. Or when we do a shared circle that like we talked to with Ria, it's like, ah, I like, I like how I show up there. That's, yeah. ah, I really love that. 
And uh, yeah, thank you for that reminder that we can do it for each other and that we need uh, the others. Yes, more often. They, they don't even need to know that you're doing it, yeah. or maybe we're not even conscious we're doing it. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I think that's funny. I try to figure out these things on my own. And then when I have them figured out, of course, it's too late. <laughs> and then the other person has built other stories. I have built more stories. Um, so yeah, one reminder to do this way earlier in the, um, in, the in the process. So yeah. And that's a regular practice yeah. too. Like Oriana and I did it for the program and our like our collaboration, but she also did it like just for our call today, it's like a small thing, small practices. Yeah, and that that actually brings up part of our own learning journey, which is we decided to invest last December and actually hire a business coach to coach both of us through some of what we were feeling around uh, sharing the program and putting it out into the world. And through that process, we worked through um, this question. And, and I wish we could show it here, but I'll just describe it. Tomomi had this beautiful illustration of um, what a most emotion she wanted to feel with me in our partnership, with people in our program, and with our greater network. And it's something that, um, as she just shared, it, it's also impacted me, right? We've come back to that together, or I've come back to look at that as well and say, oh yeah, I really wanted to be ground, I really want to be grounded in the emotion of gratitude for all of these individuals, all of these humans that show up and dedicate their time and energy to joining us in this program. That's such a gift that people are trusting us and being open to that experience and to kind of circle back to Tomomi, what you shared before as well, in terms of this collective aspect, as we said, we just finished cohort three of our program and I've been having conversations, feedback conversations with some of our participants. And something that I hear over and over and over again is the power of just one person speaking up and sharing vulnerably and naming an emotion that maybe you wouldn't normally name that you're feeling and how much that opens for the group. How suddenly this stranger has shared with you their emotional state and you then in turn become more curious and inquisitive, right? Of, oh, well, how am I really feeling, right? And, and what do I wanna share and how can sharing that actually open me into being in deeper relationship? with someone and exploring that together. And I think that really is one of the greatest gifts of the program in this collective group experience. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, Alicia, in previous conversations, you had framed some of this line of thinking as being like super positive, which is like not necessarily a word I associate with myself um, or even our approach actually. Um, and so as we're talking about what, what, what may sound like very, yeah, like, like positive thinking stuff, mm. um, I also do want to point out that considering all of this as positive is, act, is actually an assessment. Because um, I also see it as a responsibility. Like I need to be more aware of how I'm affecting other people. And maybe I've not been doing that as much as I would like, partly because I didn't notice and partly because maybe I didn't, was not aware of the, like the severity of the effect. And I can think of many times that, you know, I look back and I regret how I showed up in that space and like doing this kind of work it makes me better. And then also because you start to, recognize all the agency it's like a total pain in the ass can i say that on the podcast it's like oh my God. <laughs> like the the impact we have on other people is is huge and like once you start to see it you can't really go back and so in a way you're kind of forced to be more tend to this kind of thing 
And so like on a good day, you know, it's really helpful. It's energizing. It's like, oh, I can think of gratitude and love and all that. And the other days, uh, it's like, oh, actually, I, I still need to work on this. And it can feel uh, like life might be easier without doing that kind of work. So I, I do want to recognize that um, kind of goes both ways when we talk about agency. Yeah, I would, I would add that I think what's been interesting for me and what I've also heard from other participants is that one of the things that it allows looking at emotions more neutrally instead of positive or negative, right? Being able to say, okay, maybe they're comfortable or uncomfortable, but they're not inherently positive or negative, they're neutral. Um, alleviate some of the self-judgment aspect that we have of, well, why am I feeling this uncomfortable emotion? Why am I feeling anger or frustration or fear, right? And trying to fight ourselves on that. And instead, trying to sit with it and ask ourselves that question, okay, why is that showing up? And can I trust my body and my emotional state that this is here for a purpose? It's not just here to annoy me, <laughs> which I often feel, right? Is these emotions <laughs> are just here to annoy me. <laughs> they should go away. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think that is that is really interesting to Momi to really pinpoint. And I think it's a learning for me in this moment as you share that as well, of that assessment of it being a positive thing. But it has mm -hmm. multiple sides. Yeah, and I'm wondering, going back to the cards that you showed us, um, Oriana, about, let's say, how you don't want to feel. Um, what happens or like, what are the tools that we need to put into you if you say, okay, through this conversation at some point, because I can, let's say as the host, I will try then that you don't feel like that. But since we're, let's say jamming a little bit, it can be that at some point uncertainty, for example, with all of these topics, it's something what we're talking about is very old, but at the same time, relatively new. And um, yeah, that we need to explore a lot more in, in the workplace. And well, in general, in life, I think. But anyway, like, okay, there's a point in which you feel uncertain or hesitant. Like, what do you do with that? So it's interesting because it, this has happened throughout. And I think I picked the emotion uncertain because I have a tendency for the story that I tell myself to be, ooh. Was that the right thing to say? Am I rambling? Did I say that correctly? Being not sure that I said something the way that I wanted to. And by naming it ahead of time and recognizing that that might be present or might pop up, then when it has popped up here or there, I'm able to say, okay, I see you. And everything is unfolding right now as it needs to. I'm in a supported space. We're having this jam. It's a conversation. And there's not one right answer. And for me, that's what I need to tell myself, given the kind of flavor of what uncertainty means to me in this context. Might be different for you or Tomomi, depending on what uncertainty means to you. And I think that's something also important that we often use actually in a coaching space is as coaches, we're trained to not ever assume we know what a client means when they say a certain word and in particular an emotion and instead to ask, okay, what do you mean by uncertain? What do you mean by uncomfortable? What do you mean by hesitant? Because your experience of that might not be the exact same flavor as mine. And to be able to be in relationship and conversation, it's really helpful to understand that. Yeah, that's something I that came up as you were answering. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, uncertain it means something different uh, mm -hmm. for me. But is it an exercise, let's say, that you do beforehand? So it's like you pick the cards and then it's like, do you have, do you think then about these clues? Like, okay, I'm picking these things because I know what pattern, patterns I 
usually fall into or the stories that come up and what are the things that I need to reassure myself of? Is this the process that you follow or is it something different? It was my process today, but it's not necessarily my process all the time. I think mm -hmm. I use it in different ways and, and play with it. But often, yes, if I'm going to think more concretely about how I don't want to feel, I try to take time to think about what might make that emotion arise in me and how to actually minimize that through either an action or a ritual that I can take or what I might need to have to navigate it. And this is a word Tomomi and I use a lot. And personally, I prefer over manage an emotion because I, I don't really believe that emotions need to be managed. I think that we want to learn how to navigate them um, and to kind of move through them because and emotions are really just energy in motion. It's, it's energy moving through our body and to try to ignore that is to, it's difficult, <laughs> let's put it that way. So if we're able to actually figure out what we need to do with the energy, how we can move through it, we're in a much more resourced position. And there's a bit more of that agency we've talked about. Feel mm. less out of control. Yeah, this brings me to another point, uh, very interesting from the conversation that um, Tomi and I had last time, which is emotional processing. So I don't know, like somehow what you're saying, like it reminds me or is it a sort of my understanding partially of um, emotional processing. And I'm wondering what we were talking about in here. It would be nice uh, to hear, okay, like what is the emotional processing like I can do on my own or it isn't the section that we were saying, right? I'm doing this with someone else and also as a group. Let's say, how do we do emotional processing? What came up with um, Tomomi in the last conversation were the, the power of rituals, right? And how often, um, like in self-organizing, we do talk a lot about rituals, but also because we're building everything uh, or rebuilding everything that sometimes we don't have enough of um, those tools to actually process some of the stuff that's going on. Or definitely, I don't think that at, in our case, we have it as a, regular thing so yeah what are i don't know if you had any further realizations or or yana we haven't heard uh your take on that what can you share about emotional processing and how can we do it ourselves with others in in, in groups um if you have any hints for any of this i think that was a look to mommy so i should jump in <laughs> and then i'll let you go I've been saying this throughout the conversation, but to name it really explicitly, for me, the first part of emotional processing is recognizing and labeling what you're feeling in a, in a more nuanced way than I feel glad, mad, sad, right? Really getting into the flavor of that emotion and being more specific and naming it. And the cards that I demonstrated are a great way to do this. We also in the program offer the emotion wheel, which is a beautiful wheel that has lots of different emotions. Um, there's also a great app called How We Feel, which is a similar version that you can use on your phone. Um, and another resource I actually just shared yesterday from Susan David, who works with emotional agility, was just an infographic with some of the more um, we call them kind of families of emotions. That's a term I take from Dan Newby or cousins, right? They're really similar emotions, but they're not quite the same. So really it starts with being able to name as precisely as you can what you're feeling. What is the story connected with that? How is that showing up in my body, right? There's a level of self-awareness. And then being able to ask, what do I need or what would be supportive in this moment to navigate that? And that's going to be different in different situations. As we mentioned, sometimes that's something as simple as breath work or taking a walk, physical exercise, moving that energy in a certain way. Sometimes there's a conversation that's needed or an action that needs to take place um, to actually process 
that emotion. I'll let Tamomi jump in with her ideas yeah. as well. Thanks, Marietta. Yeah, this is something we're working on on ongoing. Big difference between cohort two and three is that we're we brought in a lot of uh, like small practices that you can try between the sessions um, and leaving it open to for you, you to try. Uh, but yeah, as Oriana mentioned some of the examples like breathwork, providing some tools. If you want to use a digital tool, you can um, tapping into music. And so this is broader than processing, um, but kind of helping people recognize that there's quite a lot of options um, and that it's up to you to choose the one that you're drawn to. Um, and then the, that the power is in actually continuing it over time. So we encourage people to just pick a few things and then try it for two weeks. And it's really interesting because people will be drawn to different practices. Um, and so it's kind of like this popcorn state. Um, so that's, that's one thing. But these are all uh, kind of individual practices. And I think, Alicia, we had talked more about like organizational rituals last time. And to your uh, point of like having forgotten about the how do you want to feel question. And I'm also asking myself because I was in this project with you and it didn't occur to me to ask you. And so, yeah, like it, it didn't connect. Like I had the tool, you had the tool, we didn't use it. <laughs> and um, yeah, this is part of like our interest um, in the later half of this year and for, for next year, definitely, um, is like, how can we work with teams um, so that people are starting to experiment with each other and can remind each other, but also maybe some of it can put be put into um, like cultural and group behaviors um, and taking more of an experimental approach, which is something we talk about a lot at Greater Than, like would love to find more ways to experiment with this. We know that a lot of people in the program, especially those who are team leaders, um, like gather the teams and start to talk about these things. Uh, but I think it's still mostly in kind of an intellectual space. Uh, like here's the tool, let's talk about it. Um, but would be really good to find more more flexible and not just not always requiring a conversation is a type of ritual that like I'm personally interested in so that it's it's more integrated into what you're already doing. I'm also interested mm -hmm. in this is the flip side again, right? We can think about that kind of what are the rituals that are helpful to create the emotional culture within a team that we want, but also what currently exists and what kind of culture is that creating? I think we don't think mm -hmm. often in organizations, whether they're self-organized or a more traditional company or team or even business partnership of what are the kind of everyday rituals or ways that we're engaging and what kind of emotional environment is that creating? Is that serving the goals or not of how we want to function as a collective? Is it something that it makes sense to um, talk about explicitly and say, okay, like what are the, so what are the rituals, but what are the practices? What are the things we're doing every day? And then what is the emotional atmosphere that we are creating? Like, is it something, and also curious, like have you seen that level of explicitness applied somewhere or is it an area where we would say okay maybe making it explicit then makes some people um, move away from it like how, how can we frame this or how can we talk about it or work on it right because I think maybe that's also the other thing that um, I think is interesting that someone was saying um, that maybe there are practices there are things we can do without having a conversation which bases might be conversation for many things but are there more options I mean, I'm personally interested in finding fun ways to do it. Uh, sometimes the topic of emotion feels like this heavy yeah. thing that maybe I don't want to talk about right now. Um, so like 
playing around with different vibes that these rituals could take. Like sometimes it's this explosive, congratulatory feel. Other times it's like this quiet, reflective, appreciative feel. Other times maybe you want to fight. And so like, I think there are different modes that we can think in and of course different time, time scales and such. Um, but yeah, to your question of have you seen like some kind of collection, right? I, I don't think I have. And to Ariana's point, I think a lot of the rituals we already have in the workplace, yeah, they should probably be adapted and rethought. Um, a lot of these are actually not serving us, which is kind of uh, something Priya Parker is always saying, right? Like these ceremonies we just inherit and keep doing because we think we should be doing them. Yes, I just smiled because I was thinking five minutes ago about The Art of Gathering by Priya Parker, because it's such a great um, book and her work is so interesting around how we gather and kind of the rituals we choose and the different moods or environments that that creates. And I think we haven't talked about that much today, but that is another distinction that um, Tomomi and I often work with is the distinction between an emotion, kind of that immediate um, triggered emotional response and a mood which becomes more pervasive and lives in the background and often organizations or collectives end up having a mood of their own. And that is something that I think is powerful to bring into the open and to name is what is the mood of the group? What is the kind of collective energy and how does that influence how everyone shows up, interacts and behaves and is the group happy with that or do they want to shift it? And if so, how? Because I think ignoring that, yeah, maybe it feels easier. Like we said, it's not always an easy conversation, but if we can make it more comfortable and fun, which Tomomi and I are trying to do by playing with different ways of engaging with emotions, then it becomes a little bit lighter. I think that's the word I want than this heaviness. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's a, well, that's a big point. And yeah, it's funny that you thought about Priya Parker. I was thinking about hosting all the time. So in the end, we're talking about like hosting spaces and what do you want to foster? What is it that, why are we together? And um, yeah, what, what type of atmosphere makes sense to create there? And in terms of mood, I think that's interesting as well, because yeah, it's so hard to change. And I think that the more time you have spent together in the group, the more it kind of like, um, becomes very like a thing, like a solid. And that often happens in families, even that mm. you have these dynamics that are like, go break that. Um, so yeah, maybe compared to families, the workplace can even be like a lighter space <laughs> to um, experiment and, and play with that. Would you have any, I don't know, like tips or anything that we say, ah, you know, someone listening that would say, okay, you know, I want to, I want to have this conversation, but yeah, like pff, the heaviness of that, you know, I just cannot do it or I don't have it in me or like I'm alone or these sort of things. Um, yeah, how can we make it more comfy and fun to talk about this? I don't think comfortable is what we're going for. <laughs> <laughs> fun. Let's right. stay with the fun. Let's stay with the fun. Well, well like interesting, engaging. Mm -hmm. Playful. Which can be playful at times, but also sometimes it can be horrible too but I think it, it needs to be interesting mm -hmm. and how can we make that happen do you have any hint or question or practice mm. well, what I mentioned before of uh, like having access to that kind of a space and recognizing your own self in that kind of opening up your eyes to what's possible and maybe it's attractive enough that you want to do something about it is the best way. Like we, no one needs to be convinced of anything. Uh, I think what what's really, like what is it that like, makes you take that one step in even if you don't understand why. And so that's the work that we put into designing the experience that people spend together um, and then finding the 
words, that invitation to join us, but also like just that conversation space is uh, like an ongoing, like we're always talking about it uh, because we, I think we keep learning over and over again that people have such different ideas of what it means to work on emotions, especially in the workplace. And we kind of forget each time because I don't know, people are so different. And it's like, wait, no, that's not what we mean. <laughs> it's really interesting and helpful for us to uh, help us become clear on what is it we think the value is and also what it's not. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm rambling here a bit. So that's, but that's on my mind though, uh, because something you said to me, Alicia, last year, and I've shared this with Ariana that I keep coming back to is, actually, this is a very intuitive mm -hmm. topic because we're humans and humans are emotional animals. Nobody, it's like, it's not possible to never have thought about this. And I think what you said, to me, when we were in Portugal, is like once you have experienced a little bit, you, you know what it is, and you don't need like ten bullet points and mm. like a sales pitch about it. I'm like oh, this is so true. Yeah. Like as we struggle to find the framing, and you know, like quote unquote value proposition of it, like I reminding myself that yeah, this is like a human thing, and to not forget that. And once people have a bit of that experience with us and in this context, and when things really start to click, and not just intellectually, it's really amazing people naturally start experimenting and integrating it in other areas of their lives, like how they talk with their kids, for instance. And nobody needs to teach them how to do that, or that be recommended that they do it. You just do it. And I think there's so much power there. And part of our work is trying to explore that a bit more so that we can take more intentional moves to try to, try to amplify the effect of what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. But now I have forgotten the question. No, that's all right. I mean, I understand what I took away, let's say, from the question, which was about how can we start doing this in the workplace to make it more interesting, was, was your point. So what I take away from what you said is like, well, you know, someone has to make an invitation or like you need to be aware of, OK, what are the possibilities in the room? One, like that's my interpretation, one person starting it. And then slowly people will have experiences in one way or the other. And then, well, it's it's a sort of and for me, it's even a reminder. Huh? Like, I know it's so intuitive. You cannot stop seeing it. And I forget about it. I'm like, oh, yes, this thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I'm also aware of time, so yeah, Oriana, if you wanted to also um, just say any final words uh, on this. Yeah, I would just add, I think there's a level of vulnerability involved in being open to make that invitation. Mm -hmm. And something that I think can be helpful is to come from your own lived experience, from your own learning space. And that's really what we're inviting people into when they join our program is a space to start to practice and to work with this themselves and then to invite others into that conversation by really sharing what their experience, the questions that they're holding, the curiosities that they have. And I think that there is to say, right, a certain mood to that type of approach to having this conversation that is quite different to other ways that you can approach it and yeah yeah and i guess that being in a program like this or having this sort of support that we were talking about before is like i don't have to do everything on my own or if you mind a group of peers that ah we're all curious and playful then it's also easier to just translate this into your other spaces without having to have a i don't know, like a very specific strategy on how you're going to do it but it's like ah you know you try it out and see what happens and you know, next time you try another thing. Um, so again, the support with each other, whatever it might be coaching or being in a group dealing with these topics or any experience that uh, supports you doing that. Mm. And something we hear over and over again is the validation that people feel mm. that have participated yeah. in the program of, oh, everyone else is experiencing this as well. 
right? Mm -hmm. The flavor might be different, but we're all human. We all have emotions. They all show up in the workplace. And one of the beautiful things about our program is we really try to bring together a diverse group of people from different countries, cultures, backgrounds, ages, gender. And so you're not just seeing yourself reflected, but really this validation in such a range of different people that are all in this emotional space. And I think that really opens something to then be able to turn to your colleague or your partner or your peer and see that in a different way and be more than willing maybe to be vulnerable and open and sharing how you're feeling. Yeah, this reminds me, I make the link with um, a follow-up program. I forgot her name, um, Kirsten something. Self-compassion. They talk about the, let's say, human experience, right? And then once you're convinced in not having this diverse experiences that, ah, this is a human experience, it's just not me. And then it's easier to bring it um, to other places and just be, you know, also more gentle with yourself. Um, yes, we first need to legitimize it for ourselves before we can no. do it for other people. Like, that's so powerful. I think it, it happens a lot in coaching at, at large. It's this, mm -hmm. like, wow, all the thoughts and ideas and stories and struggles that I had at that time, maybe I didn't recognize the enormity of it. And maybe I like made light of it, and, but it doesn't really ever go away. And then when we're able to see like, no, that was a valid emotion that I, I had at that time, you can, can feel the grounding that it brings to that person then you can start taking your experiences more seriously. And then I think it really opens up to have more human connection. And then from a workplace perspective, like more enriched relationships with your colleagues and, you know, work quality goes up and like, there's a pretty good cycle there. Mm. It has to start, like, it yeah. can't happen if we're making light of our own emotions and I say that also to remind myself because I think this is the pattern I'm trying to break also yeah ah, I would love to keep talking to you but yeah I'm aware we have to um, leave it here but yeah reminded of the price of saying ah this is nothing and you just put it to the side and you don't really let yourself um, yeah leave the bring in the, the heaviness or the the importance the relevance the um, that events have in our lives and how that then influences other people in ways that we don't want. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, thank you so much for this conversation, uh, for reminding us again, how can, a little bit, how can we deal with emotions? Why they're relevant? How can we uh, do this connection between us um, in the self, in the relationship with others, and then also in the, in the workplace? And it was a, I learned a lot and it's a great reminder of many, many things. I keep, need to keep really, <laughs> thank you thank you Alicia yeah, thank you so much good luck with the research we're big supporters and yes. want to read your paper when it's ready one day yes <laughs> being reworked so we'll take a little while but yes thank you for that <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Ariana and uh, Tomomi getting a bit more granular or getting new examples or just a reminder on how to deal with emotions in teams and collaborations and how to improve those uh, by having a look at the emotional lens. I just wanted, to, before going to the highlights that I take out of the conversation, just wanted to mention around minute 40 or so, they mentioned something that I said, ah, you said that these are positive emotions or something with positivity. And I just wanted to give a throwing a little bit of context. Unfortunately, I was not able to edit that in, in that moment. Um, but this has to do with the conversation we were having beforehand. So I was doing the podcast prep. And the comment I made was that if, um, let's say, the approach that they are taking for their work is that of positive psychology. And, uh, and I think that that's where it comes from. And also to give a bit more of context, I think that for me, the challenge or the um, actually enrichment, let's say, of talking to um, Tomomi and Oriana in both um, effectively chapters, episodes, is that um, in the research I 
um, very, very based around constructivism. So about thinking about knowledge and reality as a construct of my individual experience while interacting with the world and also acknowledging the power structures that build up my specific world. And that's not the same for everyone. And here's, I think, where topics like privilege um, come in. And we have to, I think, in my opinion, <laughs> deconstruct uh, the world around us and understand, okay, like, what are those power structures and what is it that they are doing with us? And then on the other hand, and that's maybe my mistake of thinking, uh, or put like positive psychology um, that takes a lot more this approach of, um, let's say, your actions being guided by the idea that you have of a future. Let's say, what projections are you making? And those usually are based on your past. So this is a bit of the, the reminder that I got already last time talking to Tomomi and this time as well, like also what is the power of, let's say, those of us that do have privilege and do have an advantage with those uh, power structures. And through this approach of positive psychology, also positively uh, influence your environment and that of those um, around you. So this is a... Um, I'm not saying it's a dichotomy. I'm actually very interested in how these two approaches uh, interact and where uh, they are contrary, where they complement each other, how they can support each other. So yeah, that's definitely something I want to have a, a deeper look at. So yeah, this just for, for context and just thoughts that I have um, often around these topics. And then a few learnings from this episode with Tomomi and Oriana. Um, again, the sentence like, we can do this for each other, that it's very difficult to do this on your own, to think all the time about like, okay, what are the emotions, or let's say the questions that I take with me, like, how do I want to feel? Once again, I'll try to remember that more often, I'll put it in a post-it on the wall. Um, and what do I need for that to happen, right? That's something I think that we often, uh, or I often uh, forget, and just think, oh, how do I want to feel? But uh, there are conditions that I often need for that to be able to be a possibility. And also, what are the emotions that could serve me more in a given moment? And um, yeah, first of all, being more granular and understanding better, okay, what is that am I feeling? Why? And what could be an alternative or more helpful to help me break dynamics uh, that I have with my partner or colleagues at work or whoever? And, uh, and then, uh, once again, the power of validation that we have seen in uh, previous um, episodes as well, or heard of, and how important it is when someone speaks up and then this uh, resonates and uh, then others in the group say, ah, you know, that's uh, also, I also feel that. And also, um, or not this, but this other thing, and this helps other people. Um, speaking up as well, it's a sort of reinforcing loop. And um, yeah, and then finally, I'm always amazed like how tangible and intangible this topic of emotions uh, can get and how ingrained it's, it's in every single interaction and even when we're not interacting with anyone that is present. So yeah, just the importance to keep uh, getting better at it and understanding it and finding ways to explain it better to ourselves and um, yeah, to, to work and live with others in a hopefully then better way through this work. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed this episode and more uh, to come in a few weeks and a couple of months time. So we're back in September.